Let's start it. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for uh, joining our second uh, health security dialogue organized by Global Health Innovation Policy Program at GRIPS. Uh, we're pleased to have very distinguished speakers from Okinawa and Temple University, Japan. We're, we're still uh, in the midst of um, uh, third wave of COVID-19 and uh, we still face unforeseeable future. However, looking back 10 months, uh, you know, past 10 months, we can still discuss, you know, what lessons learned and how we can incorporate mistakes so that we can best prepare for the future crisis and build health resilience. Today, we'll, we'll hear uh, from Dr. Tokuda and Dr. Kingston for what did we learn from Japanese experience. Both speakers had written extensively about Japanese COVID-19 experience, and we'll have Dr. Kurokawa to comment afterwards. Then we'll have a discussion and Q&A from the audience in remaining time. So for administrative announcement, if you have questions, uh, please uh, send us anytime at the Q&A column at the bottom of your screen so that we can address your questions during uh, the discussion or uh, the Q&A session. Since we have an overwhelming number of participants today, we may not have uh, enough time to answer all the questions. So I hope it is okay for us to read some of the questions. So let me introduce speakers for today. First, uh, Dr. Tokuda. Uh, Dr. Dr. Tokuda is a director and project leader of Muribushi Project for a Teaching Hospital in Okinawa. And he's an MPH alumni of Harvard School of Public Health. He is also a fellow of Health and Global Policy Institute and international consultant of Taiwan Association of um, Taiwan Association of Hospital Medicines, adjunct professor of Tsukuba University, Ryukyu University, St. Mariana University, Tokyo Medical University, editor in chief of Journal of General and Family Medicine, and editorial board member of Korean Journal of Family Medicine. And let me also introduce uh, Dr. Jeff Kingston. Uh, Jeff Kingston is Director of Asian Studies at Temple University, Japan. Most recently, he edited a 30 essay collection on the pandemic in Asia for the Asia Pacific Journal, Japan Focus. His recent monographs include the uh, politics of religion, nationalism and identity in Japan. And he edited critical issues in contemporary Japan and co-edited Press Freedom in Contemporary Asia and Japan's Foreign Relations with Asia. He also wrote Nationalism in Asia, a History Since 1945, and edited Nationalism in Asia Reconsidered. His current research focuses on transitional justice and politics of memory. And we also have Dr. Kiyoshi Kurokawa. He is a professor emeritus and director of Global Health Innovation Policy Program at GRIPS, and he is also a member of the uh, World Dementia Council and International Scientific Advisory Committee. With that, I'd like to pass microphone to Dr. Tokuda, please. Thank you. Uh, may I share my desktop slides with audience? Okay, so right. my talk is about the Japan's with Corona strategy. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm very honored to have a chance to talk here. Thank you for the uh, <coughs> organizing uh, staff and uh, Professor Kurokawa-sensei. I appreciate So let me start my uh, uh, history. Uh, I'm a medical doctor, internal medicine. I teach residents and medical students in Okinawa area. And uh, I also see a patient with COVID-19. I, uh, I'm a regular member of a SWAB center of Okinawa for uh, the community diagnosis of COVID-19. Uh, in the meantime, I uh, published uh, coronavirus uh, policy issues in Japan. Uh, some of the audience people may remember the uh, NHK program called Dr. G. I had the chance to uh, show up there uh, about seven times, once a year, as a regular member for Dr. G. And uh, I had a, a great time uh, showing uh, importance of general medicine uh, physicians in hospitals in Japan. 
if you have a questions uh, or some uh, you know uh, collaboration uh, proposal just let me uh, get your uh, email to this address so this is a summary of my talk. Uh, I like to talk three things. One is source control. Second one is a transmission control. The third one is a host resistance. Those three uh, points are the basic uh, strategy for infection control in infection, infectious disease epidemiology. Uh, I had a chance to take uh, infectious disease epidemiology course during uh, the time of uh, uh, School of Public Health in Boston. Uh, let me talk about the source control first. Uh, the source control in Japan, uh, unfortunately, we had a low use of tests. So test trace isolation, TTS, uh, the statistics uh, have not employed uh, enough. Uh, because of the low capacity and low manpower. And also we had an issue uh, is that the PCR test has been undervalued by health ministry for several reasons. The second, uh, transmission control. Uh, too much emphasis uh, was uh, provided on individual responsibility in Japan, I think and the uh, government issued and uh, uh, they keep a uh, policy of go to travel and go to eat. That's a uh, kind of a controversial uh, policy in this uh, pandemic uh, period. And uh, many infected people are criticized because of the getting infection and uh, tests avoided and the infection was hidden sometimes. The third one is a host resistance. The vaccine is now uh, developed, but uh, we have an uh, issue about the low trust for vaccination uh, in recent uh, years. Uh, because of the low trust, uh, I, I worry about the time limit for Olympic is approaching. Then uh, we had we have have to overcome the trust issues in Japan. So far, we had a low obesity rate, and uh, maybe BCG or cross immunity effects. We have a le relatively low rate of the uh, infectious cases compared to the Western countries, European and American. So this is a recent uh, uh, trend of uh, epidemic state in Japan. The number of cases are increasing right now. I talked about uh, comparison between Japan and the Western countries, but uh, we see uh, Japan as a one nation of the uh, Western Pacific region. Then we have uh, uh, not so good news here because Japan has a, a currently the highest number of uh, new cases in recent days. And the total this is uh, uh, very large uh, per population level. Johns Hopkins data shows uh, the Western Pacific region trend uh, graphs shows uh, Japan is uh, getting high, highest uh, in the region. Uh, this graph not showing uh, Indonesia and the Philippines. So if these two countries are included, I, 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 I've called these three uh, countries as a, uh, unfortunately uh, the worst uh, countries for COVID control. So I raised the issue uh, about uh, source control. Uh, source control, we need to have a, a strategically use of the uh, enough tests, including uh, PCR and uh, ant 
antigen test and the antibody test. But the uh, ranking for nations by total number of tests per population uh, based on the world meters info, dot info data, Japan is ranked at uh, about 150 uh, in the world. So this is a uh, actual document used by uh, Ministry of Health in Japanese government. They have a, a somewhat low uh, trust for uh, PCR testing. Uh, this information uh, was input uh, to the uh, many uh, politicians and uh, many uh, uh, physicians, including infectious disease physicians. So they have some reluctancy, reluctant uh, attitude for employing uh, enough PCR tests. Also, Health Ministry issued the guideline for COVID-19 in February, and uh, they claimed people should contact a doctor or health center if they had the flu-like symptoms of fever over 37.5. That continued for four days. So that was called as a four-day rule. So people misunderstood four-day rule as a mandatory for getting PCR test. So it actually worked as an inhibitor for PCR tests. So this led to many cases where people with suspected infections either did not make contact or were told they did not meet the standards and so are not tested. And later this was criticized and the ministry revised that. I conducted a web-based public sur survey over 2,000 uh, population throughout Japan and uh, I uh, asked them uh, if uh, their symptom does not meet the four-day rule, uh, they think they can deny COVID-19. Uh, it was about 25%. Then among people with fever or cough, which is a typical symptom of COVID-19, those who call, could call a doctor, only 32%. Those who could call a health center, only 20% because of the busy telephone lines. People with symptoms who could visit the doctor, 38%. And finally, among people with symptoms who could visit the doctor, doctor decided that PCR test is needed, but the health center rejected. It was about six, 60%. In the future, uh, people who could, would avoid visiting a doctor when getting symptoms, I asked. Then uh, about 20% of people, they said they, they like to avoid. So there is now a kind of a suppression to visit uh, doctors or hospitals. Among these, uh, the most frequent reason for avoiding the visit, possible risk for getting infection. So people are afraid of getting infection during visiting the hospital or doctors. So they have a, a hesitancy to visit hospitals or doctors. The PCR test is now used worldwide for pooled style, but the Japanese government still do not approve uh, pooled PCR testing. Pooled PCR testing can uh, test uh, maximum 50 persons. Uh, for a single procedure, uh, which uh, costs low and very rapid. Yomiuri newspaper uh, published uh, the uh, national survey data. The people responded uh, about the infection of COVID-19 should be considered as a cause by individual responsibility and uh, about 10% people of Japanese people, they say yes. Uh, this number very high, higher than uh, other countries, including China and the European countries and the United States. This was uh, the research conducted by Osaka University, uh, Professor Miura Sensei. 
and the Japanese government uh, used the budget, a huge budget for a coronavirus uh, policy, control policy, uh, based on the uh, proportion of GDP, uh, Japan uh, used at the highest proportion of the uh, the budget. But the total case of the the COVID-19 uh, estimated uh, relatively lower than European or uh, American countries. GDP forecasts uh, Japan is also uh, predicted to have a decrease of GDP. That's unfortunate, but uh, uh, I hope uh, uh, after controlling uh, COVID-19 by use of the vaccination, and uh, I'd like to see the uh, revival of the Japanese economy. Um, I and my colleagues, we are now uh, proposing a zero corona strategy. Zero corona st strategy means uh, some countries in Asian regions, they are successful for using that. So Japan currently in the uh, strategy of with corona, inc uh, including the Philippines, Indonesia, and Malaysia, but uh, many other countries in Western uh, Pacific region, they uh, employ zero corona strategy. So we could run uh, their concrete uh, strategy uh, which uh, showed the success. This is the, uh, out, uh, the effects or outcomes of the uh, different strategy with corona and zero corona. The cases, hundreds to thousands against zero to tens. This is tens to hundreds and zero to a few. Uh, we also uh, co have to consider the consequences of uh, acute uh, COVID syndrome, uh, it, it, which is called the long COVID syndrome. We may have uh, many cases uh, of long COVID syndrome uh, in the uh, with corona strategy, but the uh, cases also can be lowered uh, by using zero corona strategy. And uh, we had to employ a lockdown, uh, very strong lockdown should, uh, uh, needed if we have an overwhelming of healthcare system. So with corona has a risk to get the lockdown for people. Hospital overwhelming is uh, the issue for zero corona and the effects of economy is also large. So our hope is for vaccinations. So currently we have uh, uh, many vaccinations, but the all, almost all vaccinations, uh, the uh, foreign origin. Uh, uh, unfortunately, Japanese uh, companies uh, now developing uh, uh, not so rapidly because of the low budget. The companies like uh, Daichi Sankyo, Shionogi, and Amgen, uh, they try to develop, but uh, not uh, uh, relatively late compared to the Western countries. Uh, among these uh, candidates, the Japanese government has uh, the contract with uh, imports uh, from these uh, companies, AstraZeneca, Pfizer, and the Moderna. So there is uh, another issue for vaccine uh, trust. Recent years, uh, we have uh, issues of uh, low trust for uh, papilloma, human papilloma virus vaccinations because of afraid of the, uh, being afraid of uh, the side effects from vaccine. Compared to the other countries, Japan, is getting 
lower the average rate for uh, the trust for vaccinations. So that that will be uh, the uh, major issues for uh, next year, uh, at least uh, before uh, Olympic game. So uh, this is uh, again uh, the summary of my talk. Uh, source control, raw use of test, transmission control, individual responsibility, host resistance, resistance uh, issue is coming about the raw trust for vaccine. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. Hi, um, thank you all for coming. Thank you for inviting me. I'm honored to uh, be able to speak with eminent experts. Um, you know, life has changed for all of us. Uh, here we are zooming away. And I've just uh, finished uh, my second semester of teaching on Zoom and um, it's becoming a new normal. Uh, but there are a lot of things perhaps uh, that we we wonder about, about the life going forward of life with Corona and perhaps dreaming of life of zero Corona as Dr. Tokuda suggested. Here you see the Diamond Princess. This vessel sort of uh, became an, an icon of how uh, the Japanese government uh, didn't initially manage uh, the outbreak particularly well. Uh, the Diamond Princess arrived with a number of uh, infected people. Uh, they were kept on the ship in quarantine. And this was transformed into a giant floating Petri dish. And then people were let off and allowed on to public transport. So this was a inauspicious beginning uh, of the uh, public health policy regarding the pandemic in Japan. Now, now we're in the third wave and there are big concerns about how this might overwhelm Japan's uh, healthcare capacity. Now back in, must have been sometime in May, when I first heard uh, the government's trying to promote the notion of a Japan model. And um, clearly I'm skeptical about this Japan model. It seemed to follow shortly after various uh, domestic polls and international polls were very critical of the Abe government's handling of the outbreak and the delay in declaring a national emergency. So it seems sort of almost like a Dentsu branding campaign to try to change the uh, narrative. And clearly the case to be made for Japan is there have been relatively low numbers of cases, low numbers of deaths, especially compared to Europe, United States, uh, as Dr. Tokuda says, maybe not so great compared to Western Pacific. But the interesting thing is that uh, Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Abe got little credit for the Japanese success story. In all of the polls, he was hammered as being indecisive, complacent. And on social media, there was you know, a lot of concern about him being missing in action. So what can we attribute Japan's success to? Uh, a lot of people say it's because of social cohesion, people taking sensible precautions, masking, social distancing, and you know, the you know, casual habits of interaction, very little hugging, kissing, and shaking hands. Um, I think there's still a lot more to be known about that, uh, but you know, we'll find out more in coming years. Um, cluster busting has been at the center of the Japan model, meaning that you identify a cluster of cases and then you, you know, trace them backward to the source of transmission. Um, but in Japan, it's basically an analog system. You have these public health centers and people there will call up people and then that way trace the transmission. But because of various constraints, this cluster busting approach is easily overwhelmed. And so when you can't trace uh, at least half of the source of transmission, then the cluster model really uh, is not all that effective. And I recall back at the end of uh, March, um, President of Japan Medical Association you know, said, well, look, we should abandon cluster 
cluster busting because you know we can't trace even half of the transmissions and clearly uh, many of the uh, clusters now in the big cities there's too many of them to trace and the system is overwhelmed so i think that the cluster busting uh, approach was promoted to make a virtue of necessity uh, that essentially Japan had limited testing capacity and this was a bureaucratic bottleneck centered in the National Institute for Infectious Disease Control. And it took a while for them to ramp up testing capacity. So in the meantime, they said, oh, we're limiting testing because we have a cluster focused approach. Now, if you're looking for models in the region, uh, I think that Taiwan and South Korea make better models and they had a much more success with a digital approach of cluster busting. Far more people downloaded the tracing app on their phones and that helped a great deal. So the politics of pandemic, Abe clearly was downsized, you know, it began with the Diamond Princess debacle and he kept digging a deeper and deeper hole. In February, essentially, he went missing, kept a very low profile. Uh, and then at the end of the month, on a Friday, he suddenly announces, we're going to close schools. He hadn't consulted public health, health experts, hadn't informed the Minister of Education. Education. But suddenly parents had 72 hours to try to figure out what to do about childcare. So clearly seeing Abe wanted to be seen to be doing something and to be decisive. But by not consulting experts, not consulting with his minister, and suddenly dropping this on families, uh, there was a very harsh backlash. And then, of course, we had the uh, video tweet, you know, Abe's at home, he's uh, channel surfing, sipping tea, and uh, patting his dog. And that didn't go down too well with the public. And then here he is uh, with his Abe no mask, and that became an object of widespread mockery in Japan. Not only are they too small, but they were expensive to procure and to distribute, and many of them were uh, tainted when they arrived. So um, Abe no mask sort of dug that hole deeper. And there's a widespread perception that Abe was uh, prioritizing, trying to save the Olympics and the summit with uh, Xi Jinping uh, in the event. Both of those events were postponed, but in early March, he really was eager to try to keep both of those events going. And that is why he delayed on declaring a national emergency. And a lot of people in Japan were very critical of him for that. So I think like many global leaders, Abe failed the pandemic stress test of leadership. And we see that in Taiwan, in Korea, in East Asia, others uh, did not. Now, I believe that um, some of the lessons of Fukushima have been forgotten or never learned. Uh, I think, again, we are witnessing poor and confusing communications. There is a period of denial and lots of downplaying of the crisis. I think there's been a lack of transparency. And all of this undermines public trust in the government. And yet again, we see the bureaucratic silos, the agencies and ministries working at cross purposes. There's a lack of a control tower. Politicians and others are passing the buck. And there is this sort of general uh, impression that politics uh, has trumped public safety, and now it's public relations uh, is being prioritized over the health crisis. So it's not all downbeat, maybe. Um, I think Japan has a somewhat undeserved uh, reputation for having a fusty corporate culture. Uh, I think that uh, in the past eight, nine months, uh, Japan Inc. has shown an impressive capacity to innovate. I mean, who would have imagined the Hanko going the way of dinosaurs? And now that there's a virtual app uh, to replace it, I think a lot of companies are rethinking lots of things besides the Hanko how they process paper, how they, you know, engage in decision making. Uh, I think the communications have been streamlined. And who knows, maybe the all-important face-to-face meeting culture might be just fading. 
and teleworking. I mean, this was a trend that was already slowly getting momentum before the pandemic. And clearly, uh, since the outbreak, uh, teleworking has expanded dramatically. Uh, is this going to change the way people are uh, evaluated in firms? Uh, basically, it's not how much time you spend at the office showing how you're willing to sacrifice to a results-oriented, efficiency-based uh, model of what are you actually doing with your time, what are you producing. The time will tell whether this takes hold. And the other question I have is, will these changes actually increase productivity? My guess is probably yes. There's also social consequences of the pandemic. Um, clearly it has reinforced gender imbalances. There have been massive job losses that have affected women disproportionately. And I think that this effectively exposes the sham of Abe's womenomics policy. The misery index has increased, suicides, domestic violence are up. Uh, new grads are, you know, finding it difficult to get a new job, uh, to get a job. Uh, many of them have discovered that job offers have been canceled. And so we're entering a new ice age for jobs. And I think for many young people, this might prove to be a lifetime setback. Uh, on the plus side, teleworking is good for work-life balance. I attended a, a Zoominar at the uh, German Institute for Japan, and a researcher <clears throat> uh, uh, did a survey and found that there's been an 18% increase in husbands helping out around the house. So that is pretty impressive, but of course, 18% from probably a fairly low base. But teleworking is not a panacea. Uh, anecdotally, I understand that non-regular workers are often excluded from this option. There is a digital divide between companies. Many firms lack the capacity and clearly some managers remain skeptical. But slowly but surely, I think that teleworking, telecommuting is slowly becoming normalized. And there is also an impact on lifestyles. It's not just about we can't go out drinking with our buddies and we all have to be social distance and all these, you know, the downside. I think for a lot of people, it's been a chance to rethink uh, how they live and how they work. Uh, I think in some ways, uh, teleworking has created a more family friendly work environment easier for household tasks to be juggled and child rearing uh, tasks uh, shared between husband and wife. So who knows, maybe this might boost fertility, it might stem migration into Tokyo. Uh, younger people might think, why live in expensive crowded Tokyo when I can get spacious and cheaper housing in Exerbia? So these are some of the changes that bear watching. Some people talk about how, oh, I don't have to commute and all these things, there's less stress, I don't have to deal with a lot of the office politics, but blurring the boundary between work and home uh, might be actually also increasing stress as some couples find that too much of a good thing uh, might be uh, tasking their marriages. Um, for a lot of people, um, the sort of shift towards the gig economy and non-regular employment reinforced by the pandemic leads people into dead-end jobs or no jobs. So for many, there's fading hope. And all of us, as I said before, are suffering from a Zoomademic. On the plus side, uh, I think dogs are getting a lot more walks and more of us are eating more healthily, eating home cooking. And many of my friends post on Facebook about how they become excellent bakers. For the marginalized, as I point out for, things are not getting better. Um, generally speaking, the pandemic does not hit everybody equally. The more vulnerable tend to suffer more. The pandemic reinforces disadvantages and discrimination. Uh, the non-regular workers uh, constitute about 38% of the Japanese workforce now, and most of them are women. And so as households try to cope with Abe's sudden announcement uh, that they're going to close schools, 
a lot of women uh, left their jobs and they took on the task of raising the kids in childcare. And over the summer, it appears that, you know, several hundred thousand non-regular working women have lost their jobs. Um, so that, I think, has been uh, one of the uh, tragedies uh, of the pandemic. Uh, and also, the government keeps talking about equal pay for equal work, that, you know, it doesn't matter if you're a part-timer or full-time worker, if you're doing the same work, you should get the same pay. But uh, in recent uh, Supreme Court decisions um, have certainly uh, dampened enthusiasm on that front. So there's more working poor, there's more child poverty, and uh, you know, foreign workers and residents, I think, are also feeling the heat. Uh, at the bottom there, you can see the recent uh, controversial ad by Nike uh, I think that, you know, people uh, on the margins in Japan are suffering discrimination. Normally, I think there's more of it because of the pandemic. Now, um, Dr. Tokuda talked about vaccines and whether or not people want to get vaccines. Um, this is all key to whether or not uh, the Olympics will actually be held uh, next summer. Um, how effective will they be? It's like flu vaccines don't make people immune, they make them immunish. It doesn't mean there's a 100% guarantee. So, you know, it, on one hand, will people get the vaccines? And on the other hand, will the vaccine actually confer immunity? And so there are significant risks of holding a mass gathering of people from all over the globe. Uh, it seems that, you know, tr in trying to make sure the Olympics do get held, there is a risk over the coming months that the government might prioritize public relations over public health, make it seem like things are okay. But, you know, there is a case for caution. We all have seen how quickly things can go wrong when the government doesn't get its public health policy right. So the public clearly is going to be put at risk if the Olympics are held, despite the fact that there is very little public enthusiasm for holding them. So I guess the question I want to ask, is this experiment worth the risk? Uh, another issue that's come up is about the alliance. There are the summer and outbreak in Okinawa that stretched the, uh, the healthcare system there. The status of forces agreement, uh, the, sort of the, the rules that uh, Japan and the United States have agreed to regarding the military personnel in Japan allows them to bypass immigration and health checks. Uh, and the Department of Defense uh, basically had a policy of non-disclosure regarding the outbreak. Also, there were reports of lax quarantine um, procedures. And so Governor Tamaki of Okinawa you know, stood up and demanded uh, more information and he did secure minimal concessions. So maybe this is also a time perhaps to rethink and reopen the SOFA. Well, new Prime Minister Suga is sliding the honeymoons over. He clearly seems to lack effective leadership skills. It's not just his meddling with the Science Council appointments. He's also personally linked to the go-to travel fiasco. Go, don't go, maybe go, you can't go, who can go? And now he's talking about actually extending this program uh, when a lot of public health experts, health experts are cautioning him against it and talking about suspending the, suspending the program. I think that Suga is coming to understand what Abe understood is that despite relatively good numbers, they're not enough. The public expectations in Japan are high for clear crisis management communication. And I think that this third wave has exposed his limited crisis management skills. And he keeps saying we need to promote the economy over public health. And I wonder is it either or. If you don't take care of public health, how can you take care of the economy? So I will leave it there and uh, look forward to an open discussion. Thank you.
For anybody who have a question to send us a Q&A. If not, I would like to start maybe discussion uh, sure. you know, based on the talks uh, given by right. Dr. Kokuda right. and Dr. Kingston. It was very informative talk, very comprehensive and yeah. very specialized. And it's up right. information from uh, Dr. Tokuda about health policy. Uh, I think both of them pointed out, you know, uh, issues that we were still having. So one of the question I was very surprised was, you know, even today that, you know, a lot of countries deploy this PCR testing as a very effective way to, you know, figure out what's the situation, but Japanese government still not in the status to, to progressively, you know, embrace this PCR. How could we, what, what, is exactly the, the issue that to, to promote that. And a lot of uh, expert thinks that this is the right direction, but uh, as we see today that we still have not seen uh, increase of PCR testing capability. So how could we change the, the government mindset or <laughs> attitude to shift to more effective, more global standard way of of having dealing with this COVID situation, at least from the public health um, situation. Um, Dr. Tokuda or Dr. Kurokawa? Okay, so let me uh, okay. tell my uh, the idea about this. Uh, I think <laughs> the issue is a leadership of the central government because the central government, they say uh, the capacity should be increased. increased. And the manpower of local health centers should be increased. And the local government should uh, act uh, against the, uh, the pandemic and the local epidemic. But uh, they need, uh, the local government need a central government to support because local government do not have enough uh, budget, do not have enough uh, the organizational mm -hmm. skills. And uh, many uh, hospitals workers uh, physicians and nurses uh, uh, overwhelmed to mm -hmm. see uh, many patients. So right. lack of leadership is the issue of the uh, uh, right. low, low use of the PCR tests. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not sure about the exact uh, the reasons for not expanding enough uh, mm -hmm. the PCR tests. Uh, there may be uh, the issues about uh, uh, connections, connections between uh, central government and uh, uh, industry for PC PCR uh, making industry. Uh, and also there, there is a rumor about uh, uh, the bureaucrats and uh, the infectious disease people, they, 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 they like to uh, uh, the limit the PCR test into the uh, the national infectious disease uh, control center and uh, local public health center, not for hospitals <laughs> or uh, private oh, so, uh, private right. uh, uh, companies. Uh, I'm not sure about the uh, the exact uh, reasons behind that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then also I have a question for Dr. Uh, Kingston. Um, you mentioned very comprehensive aspect of, you know, what COVID-19 has, has impacted us. And I uh, was very struck by the fact that you brought up the Fukushima case that, that we haven't really learned lesson. So you have been, you know, observing Japan for a long time. And, you know, from not only from a political side from you know various bureaucratic side and you know various aspects why uh, and how could um japan uh learn from these lessons and reflect it into their uh current system is there any way that could be um that, that they can change to reflect those lessons or what what would, what would you see um the reasons that they have not been uh, reflected or what can we do to- Well, first I would recommend that they read the excellent report uh, written by Dr. Kiyoshi Kurokawa uh, in the <laughs> National <laughs> Investigation 
um, and listen more to the advice he gave uh, in that report and in several other talks and, and articles. So, I mean, it's not that these lessons are secret or anything. I mean, they're all out there. It's just there is a degree of inertia. And hmm. so I think that, you know, I don't think anybody in Japan would be surprised that there's, the silos are still there. Right, and they are preventing effective coordination and cooperation. Uh, how do you overcome that bureaucratic sectionalism? You know, there's a Nobel Prize to be won if anybody knows how to do that. Um, I have no. <laughs> uh, I think that you know, perhaps uh, this would be a point that uh, Dr. Kurokawa could uh, expand yeah. on. Since his report had all that sensible advice. Thank you. Uh, maybe I should respond to you and uh, I think the, to the audience. Uh, recently, I think I, I prepared some, some sort of small paper. And also, thank you, Jeff, for writing about the same slow reaction of Japan, which is the same message of this uh, Fukushima report, which I submitted. And I just gave this a brief uh, summary of what happened after our submission of the paper report. And, and submitted this and uh, personally went to see uh, the head of two houses of a parliament. And now next March will be a 10th year of a Fukushima accident. And we are, I was asked to uh, analyze the issue and by both parliaments. And then I submitted a report to the head of both parliaments in, in literally handed my reports at the end and now next March will be a 10th year. And do we see any significant change in Japan? That, that was my, <laughs> my, what I did last few, few months. Ah. And then I, I thought I write something about it, but I think I really thank you for you to write an article on this Washington, Time, Washington Post thing, ah, which right. quoting a message, that was great. But nobody respond, even most educated people in Japan is not vocal on this issue. That's so recently, uh, whenever they, somebody asked like you and others, what's happening in Japan? Again, the same thing. And I had to, my response seems to be, uh, this is Japan. <laughs> 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 so what do you do? Right? That is the same. So, so mindset is a kind of keyword in this globalization right now. And I think, uh, I don't know what to do. So we need right. more sort of out of box. Uh, how about the role of media? I, I also criticizing the role of media because press club still persists, which is a crazy thing. Press club? What is it? <laughs> yeah, I think we agree on a lot of these matters. Yeah, so I said, you know, Japanese press are just combating government <laughs> campaign thing, useless. Because journalism is to, to the watchdog of the power. So what you're doing, these are the, my message. And how about academics? I mean, that's very quiet. Media, very quiet. That this is Japan, in my view. Okay, we, ha we have uh, uh, one question from uh, audience. Um, Caroline, uh, she asked, how can the government raise public uh, confidence and trust in vaccines? Uh, because I think Dr. Tokuda uh, the law and the, uh, good uh, question. Trust on the vaccines. How, right. can, how can the Japanese government can, can raise that? Um, yeah, the, the Dr. Uh, Caroline Morita uh, writes, right. uh, in the U.S., former president said they will publicly receive vaccinations to try to promote bipartisan trust. And uh, this is not uh, uh, the same in the in Japan because the the cabinet cabinet Japanese government the chief of cabinet uh, Mr. Kato he publicly said he would not uh, receive a vaccination. He said that recently. So uh, there are many people who are skeptical skeptical about the vaccination effects. Uh, including uh, politicians and uh, bureaucratic people. And so that's why uh, the low rate of 
trust for vaccination is a serious issue about uh, uh, Japanese um, the policy for uh, Tokyo Olympic Games and uh, also including other uh, the major pro uh, public health issues including uh, cervical uh, cancer prevention mm. because there, there is no uh, the universal uh, vaccination program with human papilloma virus as a prevention mm. for uh, cervical cancer right Japan mm. uh, public health uh, the education and the uh, uh, risk communication is not enough in Japan so that's a, that's the issue the uh, central government local government and the media uh, they need to have a uh, uh, co collaboration to promote the public health for Japanese people thank you Mm. So this is Japan again. Okay, so um, it's very a critical issue because we have experienced Fukushima and COVID nineteen, you know, this year. And but uh, it seems like uh, we don't have uh, a right um, process to to reflect those uh, lessons learned into the current system. And uh, um, we have another <laughs> question um, from uh, Nobu, Nobu Yasu Abe. He asked, what oh. do you think uh, is factor X in Japan? Um, I'm not really sure about what the question do. do uh, yeah, it, 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 factor, factor X means uh, the uh, hypothetical uh, uh, defense mechanisms among Japanese people against COVID-19 because of the uh, lower cases and the lower death numbers compared to the Western countries. But uh, compared to the uh, other right. nations in Western Pacific, uh, Japan has no factor X. But talking about the factor X in Japan, uh, there are three major uh, candidates including uh, mask, universal masking. Right. That's, that's a great uh, individual, you know, right. uh, action against mm -hmm. the pandemic. And the right. second, one, second one is cross immunity against uh, the old coronavirus. Old mm -hmm. coronavirus has spread uh, throughout the Asian country. That right. may be uh, the that's advantage for Asian countries. That's the, that's the hypothesis second. Then the third one is BCG effects. BCG uh, vaccination mm -hmm. is uh, right. uh, usually used, still used for Japanese uh, babies. So I get the BCG and maybe uh, almost all uh, Japanese uh, people right. get the BCG. That, that makes some uh, resistance, but I don't know. And there is no uh, absolute uh, uh, evidence from uh, the scientific uh, papers yet. Right, okay. yet, right. Okay. I would like to ask the other panelists, what do they think <laughs> about uh, holding the Olympics? Do you, Dr. Kuroka, <laughs> knowing what you do now, do you think that this is an uh, advisable risk to take, worth taking? Mm, I'm not so sure, but I think uh, this is a very personal opinion. Is I'm not saying just personal opinion. Is maybe postponed. I think just we cancel it and maybe just aim for maybe eight years from now, later one, because next will be Paris or so France, right? And so maybe just we have to have another one, new one. But obviously that's a disaster for all the athletes already chosen, and that happens. I mean, just so that's a political decision. You have to make a bigger decision anyway. Why co postponing, postponing may not be tenable in my view. Is that a political decision of the leaders? In my personal opinion, I, I have a three major issues about this. One, one yeah. is uh, uh, no Japanese drug companies are developing uh, domestic vaccinations. That's who, a good question. Effective. Right, right. So uh, the vaccination, effective vaccines uh, may come to us about uh, uh, March, right. uh, 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 earliest uh, possibility. 
uh, March or May uh, next mm -hmm. year. That's that's late for uh, having <laughs> right. uh, Olympic game in Japan. The second one is a low trust rate for uh, vaccine. Getting mm -hmm. vaccine is very uh, right. the, uh, tough for uh, Japanese people with low trust. The third one is uh, if even if we contain the uh, COVID-19 using the vaccination or some other ish, uh, measures, uh, many other countries still have a, pro uh, ish, a problem of uh, uh, COVID-19. They, uh, they could not send the prayers and the at, at, uh, athletes. And uh, past uh, March this year, the many uh, athletes they claimed they uh, could could not come to Japan for Olympic right. game, then cancelled. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if uh, IOC people like to uh, have a Olympic game with the Japanese government, the at, uh, athletes may have a resist, uh, resistance <laughs> to come over here. So That's this is a crisis. Opinion. Yeah. So this is a crisis. So the leadership and decisions. There's no 100% right decision anyway. So recently I have been sort of thinking about and reading things, you know, all the human activity requires some at the top somebody in the university and corporate and whatever. Is there any, any sort of mechanism in Japan to get rid of this top person when performance is not sufficiently good? In the, let's say university professors, and corporate things and this and corporate at least now recently introduced board, outside board. But how about the university? So I call, already quote the university, I, you know, as a university professor, no, no, chancellor, the president of university, I respect most in recent decades as the Richard Levine of Yale, who served as a president for 20 years. And then everybody said, what? So there's a governance. That means he has been doing a great job at that time. So there's somebody or some organization at Yale or some organization to approve his extension. It, so there's no such mechanism in Japan. So that's my argument recently. Even in university. Why is it? So that's my argument. Okay. That's a, that's a question you have to think hard. All right. Okay, so um, um, we are getting uh, time close, but uh, um, um, <laughs> many uh, speakers um, talked about you know leadership problem and uh, lack of collaboration, not only between uh, bureaucracy or with the government or the corporations, and also lack of risk communication. Uh, Japan has been, you know, pointed out this the, the question, uh, issue of risk communication still have not been proved. And so maybe last question to all the uh, panelists, what would you give uh, constructive advice to current Japanese administration to just deal with the, you know, the challenge they face today, uh, that they can improve but maybe the first step? Uh, because you know, there are large issues that need to be addressed as uh, Dr. Kingston mentioned, but you know, something you, we can start from a step forward what would you recommend Japanese government, especially you know the current Suga administration, to do for next um, couple months? I would say suspend the go-to campaign. Mm. Um, I right. think uh, there's a great risk. Um, you know, uh, Dr. Tokuda is in Okinawa, and he could tell us. You know, they have a massive tourist industry, and clearly people are hurting there. And you know, but it doesn't make sense to uh, subsidize travel there where you are increasing the risk of transmission. So it would seem that you want to uh, get to a zero corona uh, before you want to subsidize travel. But with corona, I think people should probably be emphasizing uh, staying at home because uh, mm -hmm. you, you never know what you're carrying. But um, that's that would be my initial advice right mm. okay. my, my recommendation is to uh, learn ideas and the source from other countries in western pacific they are mm -hmm. successful why yeah. they are successful right and uh, 
very uh, closely we have uh, uh, successful uh, regions like uh, Taiwan and uh, mm -hmm. China and uh, right. ASEAN countries. Uh, we in this uh, pandemic uh, situation, <laughs> right? Uh, many uh, people have some ideas, uh, which are sometimes successful, uh, sometimes not successful. But uh, we can, we can try uh, to learn some ideas, and uh, uh, the people uh, have some ideas, and uh, we can collaborate for mm -hmm. fighting against the pandemic. And the pandemic keep coming, I think. Mm. The, yeah. the zoonosis, zoonosis mm. means uh, the transmission between animals and the humans. Uh, they, are, they are just keep coming. So uh, in that kind of a pandemic situation, the, the people all over the country, all, all over the nations uh, should have a collaboration to mm -hmm. contain the, the series. Right. Which is like this. Thank you. Yeah, unfortunately, Corona become pandemic throughout the world. And with a time of internet, not a hundred years ago, so that we could learn and compare what kind of response has been taken each country, each corporate in the world. I think that's so just adopt a better one anyway. So like Sweden, all the things, they are taking a different view, different action. So this is a great opportunity for this global world in the pandemic and the internet. So we have to learn and compare. So that is the issue. That's a great opportunity for Japan to consider this kind of mindset. So I'm not going to say any more, this is Japan. That is uh, our purpose to have this uh, dial dialogue series. We are inviting not only Jap you know, Japanese <laughs> expert, but also we are trying to invite you know, the, the different um, expert in different areas to learn and share the experience that we have uh, experienced. So therefore, uh, we are going to continue this discussion. No, that's fine. Yeah, I think this is a pandemic of uh, once in a century or something. And this is an internet age. Why not learn and share your experience and your decisions? And that's a great opportunity and greater public see that. And okay. Jeff, thank you. That's what it is. <laughs> After Fukushima, next in few months, we are celebrating the 10th year of Fukushima. What's happened in Japan? Okay, thank you very much. Right. So thank hmm? you very much for uh, joining uh, today's session. And uh, uh, I very much appreciate uh, those uh, speakers for sharing such a, a comprehensive view and mm. uh, special uh, information that we learned a lot from your uh, talk. Mm. And so we will going to be uh, upload this uh, video to our website and so that other people can also see it in later on. Okay. So um, we are going to have a next session on December 22nd. Uh, we are inviting uh, Mr. Yamada from Fujifilm and then also Dr. Kaczynski uh, from Stanford University uh, discussing about Fabi, Pier Fabi Pierbeo. So uh, please um, uh, tune in. Uh, we'll send out all the information out again. So thank you for joining. Uh, we very much appreciate it, uh, your participation. Thank you sure. very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. See you next time. Thank you. Very much, Tommy. All right. Mata Thank you. Yoroshiku onegaishimasu. <laughs>